Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is the spiritual quest, and my guest is Dan Millman, author of The Way of the Peaceful Warrior, a novel that was also made into a motion picture. I first interviewed Dan about this book over 30 years ago, and subsequently he has written many more books including The Life You Were Born to Live, A Guide to Finding Your Life Purpose, Wisdom of the Peaceful Warrior, Sacred Journey of the Peaceful Warrior, The Four Purposes of Life, Finding Meaning and Direction in a Changing World, Everyday Enlightenment, The Twelve Gateways to Personal Growth, Body-Mind Mastery, Creating Success in Sport and Life, and most recently, Peaceful Heart, Warrior Spirit, The True Story of My Spiritual Quest. Dan lives in Brooklyn, New York, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Dan. What a pleasure to be with you again after, I think, about 30 years. Well, it's it's mutual, and as I mentioned off air, I'm I've been looking forward to our conversation, Jeffrey. We'll be talking about the spiritual quest, and it's very interesting. Your first book, which was a huge bestseller, "Way of the Peaceful Warrior," in, in effect was a fictionalized account, but this is your nonfiction account of the actual spiritual quest that was more or less underneath the fictional treatments that you wrote. Yes. And in fact, the new book, the, the memoir, will reveal how much was true and autobiographical in my first book, but also uh, also reveals and highlights uh, some of the fictional narratives as well. One of the impressions I got is that from your earliest years as a child or an adolescent at least, you began engaging in martial arts training and gymnastics training, uh, partially for self-protection and partially, I suppose, for the love of the sport. But in either case, it seemed to set the, the template for you as to a spiritual quest uh, in m many regards, is is about practicing a discipline and achieving mastery and recognition for that mastery. Well, I, I would agree with that. And one of the central tenets that I teach today, jumping ahead for a moment, is that there is no best book or teacher or quest or path or religion or diet or system of exercise. There's only the best for each of us at a given time of our life. But I wrote the book, the new book, in hopes that my quest might leave it a, a kind of trail of etheric breadcrumbs, if you will, um, and help illuminate um, the, the, the spiritual quest everyone is on. Because I believe we're all on a spiritual quest. We might not use that language. It might be conscious or not so conscious. But everyone that I know of is seeking a sense of fulfillment, meaning, connection, purpose in their life. And sometimes even looks to the bigger picture of what is it all about. And so it's not simply my peculiar quest, and it was rather unusual, but and we can go into that, of course. Um, but it really it does reflect on uh, our shared and common quest. Well, what is unique for you is is certainly an incredible discipline. I mean, at the age of 18, you were already a, a world-class athlete, and in fact, a, a world champion uh, on the tra trampoline. So you'd already shown an enormous discipline, uh, plus a, a lot of mind-body talent to boot. Well, those early years did, in my own case, provide a sort of foundation for all that would follow. And I do look back and uh, in reflection, I see my training as an athlete and in some sense martial artist as well as the beginnings of my quest, or at least a preparation 
uh, in terms of learning and the concentration, focusing on the present moment, um, learning about a step-by-step process to learn anything. I learned so many lessons that I wasn't fully conscious of back then. Like many athletes, uh, we're so focused on, on the achievement, the scores, the learning, the games, the matches, that we don't realize how many universal laws that we're embodying, not just learning intellectually, but embodying. Um, in, so there were some valuable lessons uh, that I learned in those early times, uh, exemplified by by um, when I was a young coach at Stanford University, um, the uh, USC coach brought his team up, and and I'd already been exposed to some zazen and uh, transcendental meditation and a few um, introductory elements of what we would classically consider more spiritual or inner practice. And the coach had heard about this, and I, I was a bit of an outlier back then. This was nineteen uh, the late sixties. A time of change, of course, but still, we didn't have the explosion of yoga. It was, you know, those who did yoga were were outliers and fringe people at the time uh, in the U.S. And anyway, so he said, Dan, I heard a rumor that you ask your athletes to meditate before a competition. And I said, no, no, of course not. I wouldn't have them do that. I have them meditate during the competition. Um, he didn't get it at the time, but I'm sure you do, that it is a profound form of dynamic meditation. You can't be in the future or past when you're flying around the bars. Um, so, yes, it was part of that preparation. And other people, it's um, playing a musical instrument or um, doing another art or craft, photography, painting. That is their way, their path. Well, I know in my case, I was exposed to the widest variety of uh, spiritual practices and teachers because I've been doing interviews like this uh, for for so many decades. But you were much more of a joiner. And uh, you, for example, got deeply involved in the Arika School, where they had intense uh, practices, 40 days of uh, nonstop exercises and, and disciplines of, of every kind, where in my case, I had many friends who were involved in that practice, so I heard all the jargon, but I wasn't as much of a participant as, as you were. Well, it's funny. I viewed myself, and still do, in a sense, as a, as a devout individualist. I didn't see myself as a joiner, uh, and and yet, in fact, even when I was in the midst of the uh, Arika forty day training with the first of my four mentors, I describe in in the book, uh, with Oscar Ichazo, who founded this school called Arika. And it's funny, Arika is the word America without the me in it, without the M E. Um, and it was based on uh, a school he began teaching uh, where in Arica, Chile, which was at the border of the Atacama Desert. And 50 Americans, uh, uh, John Lilly, Claudio Naranjo, the psychiatrist, and others went down to Chile to work for nine months, uh, almost a year, with Oscar Chazo, experimenting, testing what combination of exercises, internal work, from a global heritage of traditions. It wasn't just a Hindu school or a Chinese school. It was a global heritage. What works? That was the approach. Uh, like kind of like Bruce Lee did with the martial arts, uh, Oscar did with, with spiritual or inner work. And yes, I was exposed through. Um, well, let me jump back for a moment. It wasn't just a coincidence, I don't think. You see, when I was very young, uh, in yes, gymnastics, martial arts, but also um, I studied speed reading and memory courses and um, the Trachtenberg speed system of mathematics. And I read Word Power Made Easy um, and 30 Days to a More Powerful Vocabulary and studying Greek and Latin roots. And uh, I learned uh, juggling and ventriloquism and magic, sleight of hand. I was so much into self improvement and I love learning skills um, that. Um, it took me some years of of doing this constant self-improvement until one day it struck me that no matter how much I improved myself, only one person benefited. But if I could somehow influence the lives and help improve the lives of other people, I didn't know how at that time. I had no idea how I might do that. But I think that was the moment I was called 
forward as a teacher. And not everyone is called to influence other people. They just want to learn and grow and develop their lives. But that's when I made a, a fundamental shift that I wasn't, I was no longer learning alone. I was no longer learning just for myself. Everything I learned, how can I share this with other people? It took a while for that to come into focus. Um, but because of that commitment to share with other people, I believe that's what opened me up to and dedicated me to learning for myself, but also for those I might reach someday, um, studying with these four different, radically different mentors who, um, taken together, represent different aspects of the spiritual quest, from the inner work and the technology aspect, uh, doing the exercises, to what we go into with, with the other mentors. But uh, Oscar was the first, and I, I was looking, but I didn't know what I was looking for, like many of us, uh, kind of stumbling toward the light. And so he was the first of the four primary mentors. Well, it's very interesting that you worked uh, so closely with the Eureka School and met Oscar Richazo personally. Uh, uh, the reason I, I find it interesting is that just a week ago, I had the uh, privilege of interviewing another guest I hadn't interviewed for 30 years, a fellow named uh, Hamid Ali from the Bay Area, the uh, founder of uh, the Diamond approach to self-realization and, and the Ridwan School. He he writes under the pen name of A.H. Almas. And uh, so his new book is on the Enneagram. And he pointed out that our modern understanding of the Enneagram, which has become a very popular personality typology, uh, really originated with Oscar Ichazo. It did. And many of many people attribute it to Gurdjieff, the, the mystic from the Middle East, um, southern Russia at the time. Um, and yes, he did work with that shape, that nine-pointed uh, star, so to speak, inside of a circle um, that we call the Enneagram or Enneagon. Um, and also, some people attribute uh, some knowledge of, uh, of this, this method, the system for self-analysis and looking at ourselves. Uh, to the Jesuits or even the Sufis. But uh, what happened was, uh, I mentioned Claudio Naranjo, the psychiatrist who, who went down to Chile to study. He didn't stay the whole nine months. Uh, there was a period in which they went into the desert, literally, for uh, something like a number of days uh, for deep work, uh, a period of kind of sensory deprivation as well. And Claudio stayed out longer than the other group. And when he came back, he said, uh, I'm a master now. And so uh, in, a, in a friendly way, he and Oscar parted ways. And Claudio had absorbed and really took to the whole Enneagram material, as Oscar described it. And he went back to Berkeley and began to teach at an institute of his own. Um, he was well qualified as a medical professional. Um, and he taught a number of students, and one of those students taught a woman named Helen Palmer, who was one of the most popular Enneagram um, authors. And eventually, Helen Palmer and others, Stephen Riso and others in that field, acknowledged that the source of the modern-day uh, Enneagram material was Oscar Ichazo. But what I was taught, and the other people in my in my trainings and the advanced trainings I took with Erika before I taught for them for a while um, was we learned to look at uh, the photograph of a human face in even lighting and to observe from uh, differential tensions and asymmetries in the face. We were able to read one of the nine points of sensitivity that Oscar called ego fixations. Now it's popularly termed personality types. Um, and we were able to derive a great deal of information from an objective view of looking at the face. Uh, whereas today, the Enneagram books uh, have uh, questionnaires that people take. Hopefully, they're able to answer them with some accuracy. Um, so things have changed, but I appreciate your acknowledging Oscar as the source of that material. But Arika had many, not just spiritual exercises, not just 20 or 30 different kinds of meditations for different purposes, 
um, in forms of body, deep body work, a Tibetan, uh, Mongolian warrior massage, actually Mongolian, not Tibetan, um, that the warriors did before and after going into battle to clear fear produced tensions in the body. It was a massage of the bones, which I presented in way of the peaceful warriors. The old mentor I called Socrates teaches me this in my first book, but I did learn that from through Oscar's school. Um, and movement system, psychocalisthenics, deep breathing and movement uh, coordinated. There was such a vast array of uh, elements of Kundalini work um, uh, in that Arika training. But they also had some fascinating models, to platforms from which we can stand and observe ourselves and get to know ourselves to the bone. Because Oscar said, you, you don't have to just get rid of an ego. It's our conscious self. It's our personality level, but we have to transcend it by seeing through it with deep insight into seeing all our mechanisms, which are largely unconscious uh, strategies for approaching life. So he had system models like the levels of consciousness where we could actually see where we were on this ascending uh, awareness, scale of awareness and the doors of compensation, ways we deal with tension and stress release some are more constructive and more others more destructive. Um, and we begin to see ourselves realistically. So it was a form of shadow work as well. Um, and all this was immersive. Uh, but as you point out, at the same time, there was daily life. I was married young. I was, ha we, I was having struggles in that relationship. I'm just amazed that we stuck it out for eight years. Um, but during this time, it, it, it informed me, it informed my consciousness, if you will, that even though I was learning this fantastic inner work, and Eureka really was a, a tremendous school, and I'm grateful for it, yet at the same time, there seemed to be a kind of firewall between all these inner exercises, which, got, which made me better, more skilled at doing inner work. But when it came to everyday life, I was still immature, still self-absorbed, and really not able at the time to make, to adapt to my marriage, to make it work. And so that taught me a valuable lesson that wasn't necessarily intended in the training. But um, yeah, daily life be became the school. And that's been my approach ever since. This approach to living I call the peaceful warrior's way, um, really the arena is daily life, which is going to teach us everything we need to evolve as human beings. Um, you know, I, I, I tell the story, which is true, of a man who came up to me once, decades ago, who had read Way of the Peaceful Warrior and said, Dan, now I'm really interested in spiritual practice, but I have a wife, three children, and a full-time job. How can I find the time? And he came to understand that his wife, his children, and his full-time job were provided primary forms of spiritual training. And they demand more and develop us more than sitting in a cave somewhere up on a mountain and meditating. And I know this because I've done both. So that's when daily life became the arena. Oscar Ichazo died, I think, in 2020, two years ago. To my knowledge, he, he had become, after the sort of heyday of Arika in the 70s, he, he became kind of a forgotten teacher, although I understand the school still exists. And I'm inclined to think that he was really one of the greats, that his legacy has yet to be fully appreciated. Your next teacher, who you describe as the guru, was also an individual whom I met, uh, originally known as Franklin Jones. Yes, um, he was, that was his born name. He changed names for different periods of his, his teaching work. Um, he became Bubba Free John, then Da Free John, then Da Kalki, and, and many other names, ending up being known as Adi Da Samraj. Um, and again, I am grateful uh, to the guru, as I am all my teachers, but I learned lessons of, of a different kind from him. Um, I did find him and many other quite intelligent people I know you've met too, 
um, gravitated toward him. Ken Wilber uh, said some incredible things. He, he thought that he understood uh, every teaching that's ever been taught, but better than the originators. Um, he found him a spiritual genius of the highest degree. Alan Watts said, I've been waiting for such a one my whole life. So I wasn't alone in gravitating uh, toward this particular guru. However, I am not implying, and I'm not saying to people, I'm not playing the game that many people do, my martial arts teacher is the best. But this particular uh, teacher represented a different approach, a radically different approach to the spiritual quest. In fact, he once said, I'd rather beat you with a stick than tell you to meditate your way to enlightenment. Now, that may be off-putting for some people who are deeply invested in that practice, that exercise of meditation, which has its benefits, of course. Um, but he, his approach was anti-technical. Uh, technical. He was not going to give us a bunch of exercises to do. His way was, he called the method of the Siddhas, which was sitting in his presence, in his divine company, because, uh, as he stated, and as by various internal intuitive evidence that we had, uh, the divine, what we call the, just the transcendent, was shining through him. And by sitting in his presence, which many people in the Hindu tradition are familiar with, it's a traditional thing, you sit in satsang with the guru uh, and take prasad afterward, you bring fruit or a gift of flowers and take something representing the... the uh, uh, the mutual gift giving. And that was what we were there for. That was the juice. And it's funny, sitting with him, um, I was never a very good devotee, uh, but I was a good student. And there were different levels of approach. And we experienced some profound teachings. This was an American-born spiritual master who went to Stanford University and, um, first Columbia in philosophy and then Stanford in English. And he, a brilliant writer, anybody who's read his earlier versions of his books on every possible topic, um, he, he, you know, I, I, once in a while I dip into them again um, because they're, they're just really, really profound. But he was a wild man. He was in that crazy wisdom tradition. He never pretended to be a holier-than-thou celibate. Never made any pretense. But still, over time, he ended up uh, having f uh, nine wives. They called them gopis from the Hindu tradition. Um, and he slept with many women in the community. We kind of knew it, ignored it, because that was just him. Um, and nobody was, was injured, as far as I, I know. Uh, but boy, did he, that guy know how to party. I was never at his parties. I have to give that... I wasn't one of the inner circle. Um, I had more of a typical relationship with him as a good student and appreciator of his work. But we, Joy and I were in that community for nearly eight years. And during that time, there were conditions for living in that community. Uh, a, a diet, a healthful, nutrition, vegetarian diet, uh, exercise, a little yoga, calisthenics, very balanced way of life. Uh, service. We went up to the sanctuary every weekend, every weekend, and sat with him and did service there. Um, so, it, whereas in in the in the professor's training, you went to the trainings, you did the intensive work, and yes, it started out with ten hours a day for forty days. How many people have that time today to do that? Um, whereas the guru, it was every moment, every waking moment, and probably some sleeping moments. Um, there was no chill time, no rest time, no days off. Um, we were put up against ourselves and the conditions we needed to live. And there was something for everybody. So it was a way of life. We lived in the community households, mostly in the San Francisco Bay Area, but there were world worldwide uh, pockets of community. And so he also, like Oscar Richazo, uh, he had his time of influence where there were many followers and many appreciators and so on, as you know, since you met him. I'd love to hear just a bit about your encounter. Well, I, I was invited uh, briefly to attend, uh, I think they called it the Sanctuary of Attention up in uh, near Clear Lake, California, if I recall uh, correctly. And 
He was in a trance the whole time when I was finally brought into his presence, and people were bowing and scraping and, and sometimes uh, screaming. Uh, it was almost like being around Elvis Presley or, 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 or something. He encouraged this sort of uh, very emotional uh, form of devotion. Now, uh, you, you describe it in, in, in your book that it became corrupt at some point. That This is a man who achieved a, a godlike status amongst his devotees, and that, that became, as, as you describe it, and I have to agree from what I observed, a, a kind of a corrupting influence. Well, I would agree with that, and, and it happens. Uh, I really wouldn't have expected it from him, but uh, many teachers, we've all read about the, the Zen teachers who run off with the, the women or steal the money from the ashram. Uh, teachers can be corrupted by the adulation of their devotees. It doesn't always happen, but there's many, many examples of teachers who started out maybe uh, really pure, sincere, devoted. Uh, Yogi Bhajan, for example, the head of the American Sikh Order, uh, a wonderful teacher in many ways. And, you know, Alan Watts and Chogyam Trungpa were both, uh, they drank a lot, let's put it that way. And, and uh, uh, so this is something that can happen. And he also had a very interesting distinction. I think this is relevant to the spiritual quest. He said there are three approaches to the spiritual quest and to teachers. And they correspond to the phases of human life. And we call them childhood, adolescence, and adulthood, or presumably maturity. And he said, in the childhood of our spiritual search, we, we do what children do. We seek a great parent, an all-knowing, all-wise parent, to protect us, to give them our power, to project all knowledge on them, to make them perfect, put them up on this great pedestal, as children do their parents, um, and surrender to them. And that's, again, that approach is young children and parents. And he said there's nothing wrong with this childlike approach to spiritual life, but just as there's nothing wrong with childhood. But eventually we grow out of it. And he said at that point we become adolescents. And in the adolescence of our search, we take a very different stance because in real life, adolescents need to throw off all their indoctrination and the values they've been taught and find their own values, which sometimes end up being similar or parallel to their parents' values according to the different circumstances and times they, they come of age. Um, but Adolescents tend to reject all authority. They have those bumper stickers, question authority. And adolescents say things like, all these teachers are fakes and charlatans and they're deluded and they delude other people. I want nothing to do with them. And they pretty much reject any lessons from others, any authority figures. They just say, only I know what's best for me. It's that know-it-all stage of ignorance in, in adolescence. Um, and it's a tough uh, phase, but we get through it somehow. And hopefully we reach the mature stage of our spiritual quest, which is we take wisdom wherever we find it, even in an old service station, maybe. Um, but we find it, you know, that saying many of us have heard that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. But many people think that means when we've suffered enough or we're deserving enough or we've done enough preparation, some teacher like Socrates or or the Buddha, let's say, will appear in our lives to guide us uh, or kick us up the path. But I believe what that actually means is when the student is ready or actually paying attention, then the teacher appears everywhere. Uh, I relate in the book how I learned a valuable lesson just watching a cloud float across the sky. Nature has always been my primary teacher. Um, it's available to all of us. Watching trees bend in the wind or streams flow downhill. Um, that's a very Taoist approach, I know, but it is a, a wonderful teacher of nature in the real world. Um, so the reason I think it's interesting that the guru uh, said this is because many gurus welcome that childlike devotion. They feed off it. But he didn't. He said, I don't want childish seekers. I want mature practitioners. 
then we can get somewhere. So it wasn't as if he really encouraged this emotional uh, screaming and all the Kriyas people went through. Because other people, of course, said, oh, they must be more advanced practitioners to have these kinds of phenomenon. But he said, that's nonsense. He said, some people are more yanis. They're, they're more uh, wise, intellectual. They take an intellectual approach uh, and deeply, uh, it's called samyama. You know, they deeply explore um, these questions about life. In fact, he took us, the whole community, through a phase uh, about divine ignorance. This is one of his teaching phases where he held up, I think it was an ashtray, as a matter of fact, and he said, what is this? And somebody said, well, it's an ashtray. He said, no, that's a word in, in, in the English language we have. We've learned to describe this object, but you didn't tell me what it is. And, and people said, well, it's a, a receptacle for you know ashes or some." He said, wait a minute. He said, you can talk about its function. You can talk about its history, its molecular structure, its aesthetics. You can write an encyclopedia about this thing, but that doesn't mean you still have any idea what it is. And we did a three-month deep consideration, like working on a colon for three months, um, do I know what anything is? What is it? What is it? What is it? And we went through this, and this is a vast difference between an intellectual appreciation for this idea of divine ignorance and the mystery that underlies all the knowledge we have, but then a realization of it. And I got a breakthrough, like solving a koan, a minor breakthrough, but it was there, a taste, a tip of the tongue feeling where I realized, wow, I don't know what I am, what you are, what anything is. Even as we write poetry and solve advanced math problems and do all these other things, the whole while, we don't know what anything is. Now, somebody might say, well, so what? You know, what is that about? But it was, once that mystery, we grasp it, we realize we're relieved of our position of knowing. Because whenever we have a problem in life, aren't we knowing something? I know that person doesn't like me. I know this. I know that. And all these knowers going around, fundamentalists, being the greatest knowers, um, mistaking, I believe, for this is truth. And so it really loosens one up in a profound way uh, when we realize life is a mystery, let it unfold. And so these are some of the lessons, some of the many lessons we learned from the guru before it hit the fan. And there was an article in the San Francisco Chronicle about the sex guru, um, and all this came out, and uh, parents were contacting their their young people in the community, saying, "Are you in a cult?" You know, and and this word "cult" naturally comes to mind when you talk about this powerful central figure who really tells us about life. Um, but the guru, in his humor, said, "You know, you know, this isn't a cult because it's hard to get into and easy to get out of," and that was true of the community. Except what I write about in the book, I call the, the, the thread of steel. Um, nonetheless, um, the guru pointed out that cults exist everywhere. Uh, it's, it's not too big a stretch to say there are cults around baseball players or actors or musicians, chess players, um, Judaism, uh, Christianity, Islam, they're all cults. They're mainstream cults with millions of devotees. But they're centered around an idea, a personage. Um, and so he said, that the question is not whether we're a cult, this community. It's whether it's benign and helpful to people or manipulative and restrictive. Uh, and, and I think he raised some very good points. I can say, as I think back on on those years, that uh, even though I was never a member of any of his organizations, I had friendly relationships with many people living in San Rafael, where they had one of their headquarters. Uh, uh, I also had, I think, uh, inspiration uh, because he would occasionally appear in my dreams, and and some of my closest friends were uh, devotees of him, and and I think it would be fair to say that uh, 
their experiences were quite positive. So uh, if things went bad in some ways at, at the end, naturally one has to look at the totality of uh, his impact. And I can tell from you that uh, in, in spite of some problems that may have occurred, you're very grateful for having had that opportunity to be close to him. And that's that's quite true. Um, I, I, I'm gained a considerable amount. That's why we stayed for eight years. Uh, but we distance ourselves over time, as I describe in the book in more detail. Uh, and, and eventually, uh, there, was a, there was an incident. Uh, this is after he moved to a retreat sanctuary in Hawaii, and then after he moved to Fiji, where he lived until for, in his later years. Um, and there were still community gatherings, and they did various ceremonies, and it was a, a little more like a, a, a church church meeting with a Hindu twist. Um, and they, at one point, they brought out uh, a big photograph, a framed photo of an empty chair, and I thought this was wonderful. This empty chair, which represents the divine being omnipresent, not just in one person. Or another, but um, everywhere. And they said, this is what we want you to put up in your communion halls when you sit, sit down to do your ceremonies or meditate on the, on the guru, um, this empty chair. That was great. But the next week, maybe it was two weeks, but I think it was about the next week we came back to another meeting and suddenly the empty chair was gone. They said, take those down, put up this picture of the guru. And then it was worshiping his picture, doing pujas, which is like a Hindu ceremony, putting butter on it. It's a ritual from that tradition, the Vedanta tradition. Um, and that was off-putting to me. And, and that was the last time we went to one of those meetings. Um, it was so disillusioning. And yet, all along, during those seven or eight years we were with the Guru, he was always pulling the rug out from under us. And he told us he was going to do it. But he, it was just something for everybody. And so our time came to an end eventually. And I was done with teachers. I figured I'd had two of the heaviest hitters around. And who could follow that act, those acts? Um, so I wasn't looking when I got a phone call one night. Um, Joy and I were living in a rental house with our two little girls at the time. And um, this woman said, uh, I'd like to, you know, there's a man named Michael Bookbinder who is going to be uh, giving a free talk at the local women's club in, in San Rafael. Um, and he, he's read your book, A Way of the Peaceful Warrior, Dan. This was about 1985. And she said, you know, my book first came out in 1980, originally published in hardback then. And so she said, he's read the book and, you know, he's a former bounty hunter, martial arts teacher, um, and a metaphysical healer. And it sounded kind of an interesting to me, but I really wasn't interested. I, I wanted to just find good work and starting to teach on my own. Um, uh, you know, my book had come out, gone out of print, came back into print, was getting more widely disseminated. Um, so I had no intention really of going to this talk. But the following Tuesday night, our girls had just gone to bed. We'd put them down, read them the stories and sung with them and all that. And they went, they were asleep. And Joy said, I have some things to do tonight. Wasn't that person, that teacher going to be talking tonight, Dan? And I, oh, yeah, that's right. It was tonight. She said, why don't you hop in the car? It's only 10 minutes away and, and go, uh, go hear his talk. You know, he's a martial artist. And I said, uh, okay. That okay was significant. How many of us have experienced that? Just, you know, one decision I almost didn't make, so I drove there. When he walked into the room, it was like I'd seen a long-lost brother. Uh, his, again, his name was Michael Bookbinder. Not well known, except the people who do know who he was. Um, and I met Oscar Ichazo once at an advanced training, had a chance to ask him a question. And the guru was an aloof figure, um, except for one incident I described in the book uh, where I had personal contact with him. Um, he was still an aloof figure at a distance for me, not for everyone in the community. But, uh, but Michael and I 
we had a real relationship. We went out to dinner together early on. We, we did some interviews together. We traveled to, uh, uh, together to teach a group of psychotherapists. Uh, they were mostly there for him because they, he had a little gathering of, of followers up there. And, uh, but I was there to help out with, uh, a physical, uh, movement routine I taught them, um, based on my own background. So I knew him well, and, and, and he befriended me and Joy, and we became colleagues in a sense, but also uh, there was an apprenticeship because he had a way of teaching, uh, whereas I lost a deep sense of self-trust in the guru's community. It wasn't a place to really trust yourself in your process. We were lost, and he was there to tell us uh, how, how to, to live and, and to teach us. Um, and whereas... Uh, Michael called himself, oh, by the way, I, I refer to him as the warrior priest because he taught a training, a weekend, two weekend workshop actually called the warrior priest training, which I took early on. So did Joy. Um, but he called himself a cheerleader to the soul. And that's what I became as well. And he had a style of teaching that was so appealing. It, it really reached a subconscious level. My inner child loved him. And that's the best way I can put it. Um, and he had very practical, I mean, he did teach really meta, speculative metaphysical ideas, absent healing and, um, uh, dealing with possession and entities, uh, and the, the laws around that. Um, and, and so there were areas or oh, out of body travel, uh, based on the, uh, one of his gurus, one of his teachers, uh, so this was an exposure to a very different approach. Uh, he talked to, he was influenced by the teachings of the, the Hawaiian kahunas. You know, every culture has its gifts and the, the huna teachings of Hawaii have some real depth to them. And he talked about three selves, our higher self, our conscious self, and our basic self. Uh, and it helped me to see not only who I am, how we're made up. Now, I'm not saying that was literally true. I don't know that there's a large energy form of conscious awareness, super consciousness floating over me that I would call the higher self. I don't know that there's an energy form around my navel area that's conscious in its way and in charge of the body through the autonomic nervous system called the basic self. But it was a wonderful, useful model for understanding who we are and how we work. And it explained a lot from motivation to hypnosis, how it works, why it works, to how to appeal to people, how to get people to change and even heal uh, through what we commonly call the placebo effect, which is really the master healer. Um, so uh, he had a great deal of wisdom and actually it was career training. Not only did he did I model his style of teaching, which was more dramatic and, and um impactful than some of the other teachers I had. But also, um, being around him was exciting. It was like when he taught me race car driving and the ways to steer that, that, and, and doing skid plates, uh, spinning around. And it wasn't like driver ed training. It was like, uh, preparing for doing hostage rescue work. So it was very exciting and dramatic around him. He told great stories, some of which might have even have been partially true, um, that were instructive. And so he, but, I, but he also, uh, in a way, in his way, immunized me from succumbing to charismatic and exciting, dramatic teachers who make everything larger than life because I'd been there and done that with him. Um, and through uh, sad circumstances, in his case, it was a, a health, a chronic health issue that blew up on him. Um, it, it changed his personality, uh, and he became almost a shell or a shadow of himself um, through no fault of his own. But we ended up, he moved away, and we, we parted ways through ways I talk about uh, in the book, of course. Um, and now you can imagine if I wasn't looking for a new teacher before I met him, I definitely was done at this point with teachers. Before we move on, let me ask a, a, a question, Dan. The story that really impressed me about your experiences with Michael Bookbinder had to do with 
I guess I would call it the knife test. You were engaged in martial arts practice u- using knives. Yes. Um, as I said, he had a dramatic ways of teaching. And because he trained in the martial arts, and by the way, you know, I'd been exposed to many martial arts teachers by this time. Now, some, some people focus. They become specialists. They practice one martial art for their whole life. And they're devoted to that art. It's like one church, for example. And some of them mistake the martial art for a church. Um, but uh, Or one religion, one path, one diet, and so on. I was a very good generalist. I loved taking different arts, uh, from a little boxing to judo to karate to Okinawan-style karate called Okinawate to Aikido to Tai Chi to some Filipino uh, arts of Kali Eskrima Arnis. And I can tell you that he was a really good martial arts teacher. He connected it to life immediately and took the finer points of martial arts. There was no punch, kick, step, you know, kind of dogmatic mechanical approach to the arts. His was more like Bruce Lee, but the approach to living, not just doing martial arts. Um, so um, it was natural that he would teach a course, which uh, at an advanced training he taught. Joy and I were there with our little girls uh, and someone to help watch them while we were in sessions. One of the core elements of that advanced training was... Uh, a course in not just self-knowledge, but making fundamental shifts in our life that we might not have made any other way through the intensity of uh, learning to fight with a knife. So it was a knife fighting course, again, based on the Filipino arts, um, basic movements. Um, There are 12 essential strikes in the Filipino arts. We did five of them. Uh, with the knife. One can work open-handed the same way, but the knife gets people's attention. And they were rubber knives. Nobody got killed, but we treated them like cold steel. And after a, uh, a period of preparation where we practiced slow motion, very relaxed, um, there was a test. And the test, uh, we saw our life pass before our eyes. The pressure was immense. And even told us, if you fail this test, the training is done for you. And we were not, anybody who failed and, and the training was over for them, um, we were not going to hear material that was life-changing. I'll go into that in a minute, if you, if you like. But there was a lot riding on this test. It wasn't just learning the skills of knife fighting. How many of us have to do knife fighting in our life? Uh, maybe in past lives we have, but um, not likely. But the benefits, the overriding benefits of learning how to move in a coordinated way, learning how to face our fears and grace under pressure, that was really what it was about. So that's why his methods of working with the subconscious, the basic self, um, having us work with weapons at times, uh, assembling and disassembling a, a, a pistol or an AK-47 uh, a, a automatic uh, weapon, these kinds of things were uh, affected me at a deeper level of confidence, uh, which helped me understand why some people who may lack security in other aspects of their life like to work with guns, the sense of power uh, that they derive from it. Uh, and that takes place at the basic self or subconscious level. Um, not that I'm a big gun person. I'm not. Um, I don't own one. So, But still, there were, there were elements in that training that I really couldn't get from the guru or even the professor who had studied martial arts himself and it was reflected in, in his teachings. Um, so, yes, and, and one reason I was at this advanced training, one reason I attended with joy is because at one point in our relationship, Michael said, uh, come visit me in my, my home in, in Mill Valley uh, where he was living at the time. And he did a reading for me Now, those who don't know what a reading is, most of your listeners probably will, but it was like a consultation. It was, it began with a past life kind of material, which I found astonishing um, because I seemed to resonate with it so deeply, what he was telling me. There was something about my life now. And he then gave me information and gave me certain universal laws, called spiritual laws, that could help overcome the hurdles on my own particular life path. 
And he, he really shed light where I'd been stumbling in the dark uh, much of my life. I saw qualities, weaknesses that I needed to overcome. I saw strengths that I hadn't fully appreciated. And what I said, you seem to know me in some ways better than I know myself. Are you some kind of psychic? And he said, no, I'm not a psychic. He said, most psychics aren't even psychics. He said, but I've been trained to know where to look. And that fascinated me. What did he mean he'd been trained to know where to look? Well, when he announced he was going to teach attendees at this advanced training how to look where he looked. And I said, you mean I can learn to do for other people what you did for me? And that's when I stepped forward and began teaching at that point, really, in my life. I taught gymnastics, but not big picture elements of life. That's when I, So I really made a fundamental shift in my life. And so... People who failed the knife test weren't going to get this information. And so the pressure was on on many levels. So we did the knife test, and it was it was transformative. And I ended up, um, a year later, uh, starting to teach this training myself. It was an instructor training that I attended in, in Hawaii at the time. So uh, for 14 years, I taught spiritual growth through knife fighting. And people came from all over the world. It was always full. Um, and I don't teach it anymore. So this is not a commercial message. Uh, maybe once I'll do it again in the future. I don't know. Um, but it was really profound for people. But it was so labor intensive. I decided I'm getting too old for this. So, <laughs> uh, And I needed a staff and everything to do it. Um, but that was one element of his teaching. So I appreciate you bringing it up. Did you learn to see the way he saw? Probably nobody saw exactly the way he saw. He, he was, uh, he described himself as clairvoyant, which just means clear seeing. That's all clairvoyance means at its root, of course. Um, but it did open sight. It did, in, uh, for example, uh, after his series of lectures revealing the basics of this system, which I now call the life purpose system, uh, that I revealed uh, in a book called The Life You Were Born to Live, um, we could do it by numbers. We knew certain things, certain vibrations, and we knew someone's date of birth uh, and those in the group and myself. But I took careful notes from his lectures and I typed them up every night to help reinforce them. And, but I only had 20 pages and just small pages, not full typewriter pages, small pages. I typed them up on a little notebook and that's all I had. But I went home and I started doing readings for friends, relatives, anybody who wanted to try this. And pretty soon I internalized that information. And after doing readings in person for, for a year uh, with many people, I, I started doing with cassette tapes at the time. And finally, after uh, I think it was about mm, seven years, um, I taught a training for helping professionals in the system. And that's when I realized I had a sense of urgency. One of these people are going to write a book about it, but they won't know it as well as I do. So I have to write the book. So I did. And that book has been very popular, uh, you know, over a million readers uh, ever since. Um, but again, that's what I learned from Michael Bookbinder. I learned the knife fighting training and an approach to making life exciting and, and using daily life as our, our ground of teaching. And your final teacher, uh, about whom you wrote, you refer to as the sage, who uh, I see him largely as a psychologist. He taught a system called constructive living. Yes. Uh, and, you know, you might wonder, was I going to find another professor out there who would give me more techniques? No. Thank you. Been there, done that. Um, and by the way, I, I studied Avatar. You've probably heard of the Avatar training, which was working with beliefs, creating resourceful beliefs, discreating in their terminology, beliefs that no longer serve, um, based on the belief that your beliefs control your life. So you have to believe that. Um, and there are, you know, life spring, S. I mean, there are all kinds of approaches, techniques, methods, uh, and systems. Um, it's not like I didn't hear of them. I have experience in, in, in many of them. Um, I studied NLP as well, linguistic programming, in order to be able to speak about it with some authority, not just from an outsider's view. Um, so was I going to find someone? Uh, was the sage someone to give me more techniques? No. Was he a guru you sit with? No. 
Uh, was he like the warrior priest? Nothing like the warrior priest. He was almost the anti-warrior priest. He was an academic, and he studied anthropological psychology. His uh, One of his graduate fellow graduate students at UCLA was named Carlos Castaneda, uh, and they were friends, and they knew each other and, and worked with each other some. Um, but he took a very grounded approach uh, based on two of his mentors, one a Japanese psychiatrist named Shoma Morita, and one called uh, Yoshi, uh, Yoshimoto Ishin, um, who was a lay Buddhist priest and business person. And he devised a system called Nikon, which is about looking inward. Um, and they were two facets, balanced facets, uh, complementary, uh, that he expressed as constructive living. And the way I ended up discovering him is I was going to be doing um, uh, recording a tape at a, a company called Sounds True. I'm sure you know of Sounds True. Uh, re- a very good reputation uh, in Colorado, and they do audio programs, and now that I believe they publish books as well. And uh, uh, Tammy, the, uh, the the president of Sounds True, said, Dan, because you're going to be doing a tape with us, uh, I'll send you our catalog, and if there are any programs that appeal to you, let me know, and we'll just send them to you. Well, I looked through the catalog, and at one point, I would have been like a kid in a candy store. I, oh, I have to do this. Oh, I, I want this. And I got to learn this. It was like FOMO, you know, the fear of missing out. I, I didn't want to miss anything. But at this point in my life, I knew I'd evolved somewhat. Because it's like, mm-hmm, yep, thank you, no, thank you. Mm-hmm. Not that there were any bad programs. But for me, I kind of, you, let me put it this way. You know, in the old days, remember bookstores? We used to go into bookstores. That was the only way we could find books before the internet. And, and we'd, we'd pick them up and take them out and, and open the first page, look at the jacket, lick them, whatever we did to know whether it was for us. Uh, and some books you pass by because you've been there and done that. Just no longer appeals. Uh, other books you can't even see because they're invisible to you. Not literally, but because you're not ready yet. And But when you find a book that's just right for you at that time, it's a magical moment. And that can be done to some degree online. Um, but that's the magic of bookstores. And in the same way, I was going through that catalog of uh, t- audio programs. And it was, uh-uh, no, no, no. And I was about to just toss it when I, my eyes caught a very modestly Pro, modestly stated program, not not uh, magically raise your kundalini and you know, all these kinds of you know dramatic things, but it was just constructive living. Wow, how to live constructively and function well in life, um, no matter what you're feeling, whether or not you're motivated, whether you're confident or not, uh, and that's that seemed pretty interesting to me, uh, and you know functioning. Functioning well, completing tasks it may not sound too spiritual or sexy, but those people who finish what they start and get things done have more of a default sense of fulfillment in their life and satisfaction than do- and have even happiness than those who don't get things done. So functioning is no small feat. And that was the first aspect um, based on the work of Morita, uh, Dr. Reynolds, who spent a lot of time in Japan and spoke Japanese fluently, and um, he translated this work and, and in his own way, based on his experience, and he was a PhD, as, as you pointed out, in psychology, or in anthropology, but with a psychological bent. Um, and Morita had a wonderful quote that Dr. Reynolds um, used to share with people. He said, when running up a hill... It's okay to give up as many times as you want, as long as your feet keep moving. And that quote conveys the essence of one of the aspects of this this teaching, which is uh, Dr. Reynolds pointed out something to me that was genuinely new, because I'd been up in the sky of mind, abstract ideas, metaphysics, powerful images, you can do anything, and, and you're working with the subconscious and to get these results and so on. And he pointed out, um, in contrast to the belief that most of us have today, we've grown up in a psychological culture, and we make the assumption that 
in order to live wisely and well, we have to fix our insides. We have to somehow have the right thoughts, positive thoughts, or a quiet mind in order to function well and live wisely and well. And we also have to have the right emotions, confidence, courage, kindness, love, peace, happiness. Then we're living the good life. And Dr. Reynolds pointed out we have very little direct control by our will. We can't will ourselves to feel differently from the way we feel in any given moment. We can do any number of techniques to try to influence our emotional state, our mental state. And there are many teachers and books tell us you can use this technique in NLP, do an anchor, do this, do that, uh, reframe, crunch things together to change your state. And these are all ways to influence our emotions. Method acting is a method of trying to influence our emotions to bring a more genuine performance. Um, But influence is different. When we influence ourselves or anything, we exert an effort in a direction, which may or may not get the desired result. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. In that sense, we can influence the weather. We can seed clouds with silver iodide, whatever that chemical is, and sometimes it causes precipitation. Uh, I hope the Californians get some rain these days. Um, in any case, um, there are things we can do to influence the government. We can vote. We can support campaigns, donate, and, and do all these things are influence. We can influence our children by negotiating. We can influence other people. Um, but control means I want something to happen. I will it to happen. It happens. That's control. And so... He pointed out that we have very little direct control over thoughts that just pop into our awareness. They arise literally in our field of awareness, and we see them, we we hear them, we note them. Uh, thoughts, he said, happen to us. We don't say, I think I'm going to think this thought next. We don't have a spam filter in our heads to stop certain thoughts. In fact, I tell this to many of my students, the best way I know of to... Um, obsess, become obsessive on something, is try not to think about it all day. So we have very little control of our thoughts. So I've made friends with my thoughts. I don't try to stop them, follow them, do anything with them. As I would in meditation, I just note them. They're there, then they pass. And the same way with emotions. Emotions, he pointed out, are like the weather patterns of the body. They arise, we feel them, and then they pass on. Emotions change all the time. We can test that in our own experience. Um, So he said, rather than struggling to try to control what we have very little direct control over, um, and this is what he learned from uh, Shoma Morita, the psychiatrist, three guidelines for living wisely and well. Accept your thoughts and feelings in any given moment as natural to you in that moment. Whatever the circumstances are, that's what you think, that's what you feel, positive or negative. You accept them the way you would, again, in meditation. Take a note. Hmm, that's what I'm feeling. That's what I'm thinking. But they no longer have power over us. In fact, I feel more fully uh, today than I ever have before. I feel all kinds of emotions. I'm no longer afraid of them. They no longer control me in the same way. They just arise. I note them. I feel them. Uh, But he said... So first of all, accept your thoughts and feelings as natural to you. Second, know your purpose. In other words, live purposefully. Live based on what is your purpose. It's very respectful of the individual's process. Don't live according to Dan Millman's philosophy or a book you read or what any authority figure told you. What is your purpose? What do you want? What do you need? And the third is do what needs to be done in line with your purpose. Now, many people hear that and go, yeah, but how do I get motivated enough? How do I motivate myself to do what I need to do? You don't need to be motivated. We've all taken out the trash, changed somebody's diapers, um, gone shopping, gone to school, done our homework, uh, gone to work. Whether or not we felt particularly motivated, but it needed to be done. So we all know what that is. And we can do that in any moment. So what I've developed... Now, I need to say at this point, having studied with the sage and with the other mentors, I I don't just parrot what they said. I couldn't do that. 
I could never bring the same charisma that the warrior priest brought. I don't have the mojo of the, the guru. Don't serve that function. Don't even want to. Um, the professor, through his own particular uh, incredible story and lineage, which I describe in brief in, in the new book, um, through his experience, he created a school. So what's taught in that school needs to stay in that school within its confines. I don't, I don't, can't, it's like taking parts off a car. It's not going to drive. So um, instead, what they did was my mentors opened doors of insight where I was able to access what the warrior priests would probably call the Akashic record, but access intuitive wisdom that I share in my own words, in my own way, which turned out to be the way of the peaceful warrior. And by the way, I should mention in context for those who don't know my work, uh, I view everyone as a peaceful warrior in training in the sense that we're all seeking to live with a more peaceful heart, a sense of serenity, equanimity in the midst of the chaos and change of everyday life. Um, life comes at us in waves of change we can't necessarily control or predict, but we can learn to surf. And so that's part of, of what I teach, this idea of living with a peaceful heart. Now, you understand now, I'm not saying feeling peaceful all the time, because we don't. We feel many different things, but it's behaving with, with in a peaceful manner. Um, and so there's also times, though, we need a warrior spirit. It's not just about fighting. The idea of warrior is connected to war and fighting. But except maybe we have our own battles with our inner demons of fear, insecurity, self-doubt. You know, we have to maybe conquer that in that motif, that metaphor. Um, but I'm really talking about just rolling up our sleeves and marching into life and facing everyday life. And what I mean by that warrior spirit, in a sense, is and one of the most controversial things that I remind people of. And that's what I do. I offer perspectives, observations, and reminders of what we all know at deeper levels, but we tend to forget. So one of the reminders I offer is that I no longer encourage people to feel kind or to feel grateful or to feel happy or peaceful or loving or courageous. I only recommend and encourage people to behave with kindness, to behave with love, to behave with, with confidence, no matter what we're feeling. Now, some people will go, well, hold on, Dan, isn't that kind of inauthentic? You know, I mean, isn't it pretense when you're feeling one thing and you behave another? And to them, I respond, what if there was a child in a burning house yelling, please help me, help me? And terrified of fire, you found yourself running into the house, grabbing the child and running out. You felt terrified. Uh, shouldn't you have listened to your feelings? And yet you behaved with courage. So maybe it's a moment of transcendence when we feel one thing and behave another. And in a way, that's a real, everyday, solid form of liberation. We hear about liberation in the Buddhistic sense all the time. Uh, some transcendental awakening. But... Uh, liberation from emotions, liberation from thoughts, positive or negative, and just focus on what needs doing right now and doing it. Back to the just do it school. So, but it's not fake it till you make it. It's not waiting for the emotion that if you behave that way, the emotion will follow. It's not trying to generate any particular emotions. It's allowing our emotions to be what they are respectfully, allowing our thoughts to come and go as they will. That, that radio noise, the background noise. And meanwhile, living a purposeful life based on constructive action. Now, we're not robots. I don't always do that. Uh, Joy and I still bump heads now and then, you know? In fact, it took me 25 years to finally realize that she wasn't criticizing me, she was improving me, <laughs> sometimes rather enthusiastically. So the point is, there are times where, where um, she knows how to push my buttons too. So I'm not putting myself out as the perfect robot, the perfect, you know, um, human, divine human prototype, as the professor used to call it. No, I'm a peaceful warrior in training along with everyone else. 
Um, and, and because I'm like everybody else, I think that's why I've been effective in maybe uh, in my teaching, because people could relate to what I was writing. So that is kind of my... Oh, I, I should also add one more thing, and that is the, uh, the sage pointed out that uh, accepting your thoughts and feelings, knowing your purpose and doing what needs to be done... Uh, that can help also a criminal to get things done. You know, oh, I have all these feelings of guilt and maybe I shouldn't, but that's okay. I'm just going to do what I need to do. So he, he realized it needed a moral component to balance out the purely functional component of his teaching. And so that moral component he found with Ishin Yoshimoto, um, which was Nikon, looking inward and realizing our indebtedness to life. And there's a process in Nikon, another three-stage process of asking ourselves three questions in relation to other people, which is, what did I receive from that person? You know, I, I do it with my wife sometimes at night. I'm about to go to bed and I contemplate that day. What did I receive? Well, she made me a wonderful lunch and dinner today. And she gave me a hug. These are concrete things, not abstractions. Um, and then the second question is, what did I give back? Turns out, maybe I give back less than I receive. And the third and most important question is, what troubles or difficulties did I cause this person? And uh, many people don't really like to ask that question or, or find an answer to that. It's a very humanizing and humbling uh, process. And I did a retreat that was like 16 to 18 hours a day just sitting behind a screen, uh, having being served meals, at the same time contemplating my relationship with my mother, that's traditional, first, my father, um, and some people it's another caregiver, and then significant others in my life. Uh, for five days I went through this. And, wow, I really talk about shadow work and seeing yourself realistically without all the self-imagery and pretense. It was really humanizing. Um, now, I'm not giving the pretense that, oh, Dan is so humble. In fact, I'm not as humble as I used to be because I came across another quotation, which you know I love, from Golda Meir. She said, stop acting so humble. You're not that great. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, uh, yeah, I'll stop acting so humble. I'll just be myself. So that, that I think, completes, you know, my little journey for what we can cover in, in this time about the four mentors, at least. And, and anything else you'd like to uh, address, I'm very happy to address. In the Let me just finish up with this. You achieved some fame and notoriety because of your fictional works and the character Socrates that you wrote about. Many people assumed that Socrates was a real figure like... Don Juan in uh, the Carlos Castaneda books, and you reveal in this book that uh, actually he's a fictional character and, and a part of yourself, and then you go on to say that really we all have that kind of a teacher within us. Maybe you could elaborate on that a little bit. Sure. Many of us have heard of so-called channels. Uh, one of the best known ones was this Ramtha character channeled through Jay-Z Knight many years ago. There's still groups that, that uh, work around those teachings. And there are other channeled characters. And they, they say, I'm, I'm, there's a, you know, Seth Speaks is a, a, is a classic a book in Nature of Personal Reality and um, Jane Roberts. Um, and, and a wonderful book called The Manual's Book. I don't know if you remember that book. Yeah, Ram Das wrote the introduction to that. Um, and, and these are all channeled works. Uh, my personal belief is that all of these, there's no long dead 20,000 year old discarded entities speaking for, through these people. These are, are people they created consciously or unconsciously. Maybe it feels like a truly separate uh, personality or character speaking through them. And they often speak in a different voice and so on. But I believe uh, through my own experience, in a way I channeled Socrates. Um, I don't think at the time I wrote the book, uh, I was just like 34 years old when it came out. And this was after I'd met the professor and the guru, uh, before I met the warrior priest and the sage. But that's, 
I, that was my outpouring, my sharing. And if I had just written, Dan Millman says this, Dan Millman says that, who is this Dan Millman character? But somehow, through creating Socrates, that wise, enigmatic, uh, and there are elements of the professor and elements of the, the guru in him, um, I was able to step outside myself and rise above and express wisdom in a way that maybe Dan Millman, that persona, couldn't have done at the time. So, um, in a sense, I've been, I've been becoming Socrates all these years. I didn't do it consciously, it just... Because, look, Daniel-san had Mr. Miyagi in The Karate Kid. King Arthur had Merlin. Frodo had Gandalf. Um, there have been, since time immemorial, there have been the mentor-student relationship. And whether, whether uh, Castaneda actually had a brujo he worked with named Don Juan is, is still a, a question, um, definitely up in the air question. Um, but figures from legend and life uh, I honor that student-teacher relationship, and that's that's the function that Socrates served uh, for many people. Well, Dan Millman, what a joy to be with you. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with me and, and to uh, allow me to share you with the New Thinking Aloud audience. Truly, it was my pleasure, Jeffrey. It was great to speak with you again. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us.